Hey you geeks! Welcome to Words of Radiance Spoiler Review Part 2. My non-spoiler musings are in Part 1 along with my assessment of the major character arcs of this book. Now let's break down the rest of it. Magic Systems So much can be said about this magic system, but I'll limit this segment to how Sanderson's exposition got me deeply invested in its rules and users. For I value character relations above rule systems. With Shara's magic is both. It is contingent on the bond or relationship between humans and Spren. Sanderson can and does expertly use the formation of the bond to establish the rules of magic which is so much more moving than a lecture. Wind running. This isn't flying, this is falling with style. Is both learning the surges and being nice to your blue tinted spread. Likewise, light weaving is also about lying to the world while being honest with your pattern. Both Kaladin and Shallan grasp the fundamentals of their surges by chapter 52, Into the Sky, which has to be the best training montage I've ever read, but spend the rest of the book and probably the rest of the series learning to bond with their spren. Other magic systems, even really good ones, are usually just a set of skills, maybe coupled with a philosophy that masters teach their apprentices. Luke and Obi-Wan, Vin and Kelsier, magic is passed from the old to the young like a precious heirloom. Now, I like heirlooms just fine, but I love friendships more. World building. Again, there's a lot here, but let's just cover how. Everyone's a little bit racist sometimes. The Alethi cast system is wonderfully complex and picks up the subtle distinctions that many fantasy tales leave out. It is no concern of mine whether your family has, what was it again? Um, food? Ha! Huh? You really should have thought of that before you became peasants. Existing somewhere between the English peerage and Indian Varna systems, the Alethi castes are not all bad, but deeply flawed. Sanderson's nuanced and complex system makes sense within its fantasy, but gives a new context to discuss real-world discrimination. As the most direct descendants of ancient radiance, the Light Eyes' knowledge of weapons and sciences would have landed them on the top of society anyway. But the legal barriers on Dark Eyes is a deep flaw and gets our boy Kale into so much trouble. Though, Cal's self-victimizing attitude only made a bad situation worse. Shalon was right for calling him out on being just a disagreeable person who some people don't like. The king's shock at Captain's Knots on a Dark Eyes was very different from the writing master's annoyance at having to explain gender roles, which was also very different from Adolin and Shallan being annoyed at Kaladin for interrupting their date. Sanderson's writing makes it clear that only one of these events was intentionally discriminatory, yet Kaladin took them all the same way, building both his character and world brilliantly. Interludes. The Parshendi. Since Shen's inclusion in Bridge 4, I knew the Parshendi would not remain nameless, unsympathetic villains for long. But I did not realize how much of a Greek tragedy they would become. I was thinking of the immortal words of Socrates, who said, I drank what? Eshenai's determination to resist the old gods and save her people, leading her to fall to the old gods and destroy her people, was perfectly tragic. Meanwhile, Venli is such a jerk. For being a scholar, 
She apparently slept through history class and did not learn the doom of those who skip history. Caravangian remains a real piece of something. His visit to the Night Watcher echoes of the Oracle at Delphi. Like Croesus, who went to war to destroy a great empire, I'm fairly certain that Taravangian has misinterpreted the gift and deluded himself into believing that what he is doing will save humanity. Javert and Gavroche. Oh, I mean, nail and lift. If the law is reason free from passion, then I wonder what nail is, as he lacks both. <laughs> Reason separates judge, jury, and executioner. Yet there he goes, lurking around. I am the lawyers and judge all in one! If Nail is emblematic of the heralds that remain, humanity is up a real creek. Lift is a lot. <laughs> While I understand the need to lighten the mood after Calden swears to never again save a light eyes, Maybe Sanderson could have put Seth's interlude in before hers, just so the reader is not bashed over the head with her awesomeness quite so suddenly. Seth's the perfect mix of irrational self-delusion, who is just a heaping bag of emotions. His internal struggle with his assassinations are fascinating. Sanderson is quite cruel to him. Exiled as an assassin for saying that the desolations will return, and the first job he has sets the new desolations in motion? It's like rain. But now he gets a second chance at life with Nail. This is going to be wonderful. Plot. Crouching Sadius Hidden Odium. Oh, the ghost bloods are doing something. Meanwhile, the diagram is trying to kill both Dalinar and Elicar at the same time. And the only person who could have fixed everything is dead. Or in Shadesmar, or both. I didn't see either of Renarin's twists coming. He's just so awkward, it's hard to distinguish between normal weirdness and magical weirdness. His countdown gave the book a real sense of tension, even when everything seemed fine. It started to crack Kaladin's relationship with Dalinar and gives the reader a cocked gun on the table, just waiting to fire. But Chekhov's guns make for poor first act villains. So we get Sadius. He is a great minor villain, probably because he doesn't view himself as minor. I need to despise someone to get invested in a plot. Sadius is perfectly hateable and clever. The 4 to 1 duel was brilliant and would have worked if not for Kaladin. His second attempt was also well played yet had the unfortunate side effect, for him, of placing everyone exactly where they needed to be to solve their problems. If not stranded in the chasms, Kaladin would have never told Shilan that the planes were a pattern, and she would not have solved them. It also gave Sanderson one final opportunity to make chasm fiends menacing. The beast which took all the king's horses and all the king's men to take down last book now only took a surge binder and a half. The chasm's detour is a perfect example of damseling characters to push them to their limit. I wonder if misadventures with Kaladin is going to be a reoccurring thing. Everyone else went on a life-changing field trip with Zuko. Now it's my turn. But Sadius is ultimately small fries compared with what's coming next. He can't even recover from a knife to the brain. I was shocked that Adolin went that far, but murder is often a personal affair and anyone can snap. Now we're down to the radiance against Odium, 
armed with the most terrifying song in fiction since the hunt for Red October. And for a second, I thought I heard... Heard what? I thought I heard singing, sir. Singing. Despite our hero's efforts, I don't think they did their best this round. The Everstorm has come. The Radiants are certainly playing with the big boys now. I'm so glad that I started this series after Oathbringer came out. With Roshar on the brink of being overrun, I don't know how anyone could have waited years to find out what happens next. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe if you would like to see more. Your patronage is greatly appreciated.